probably the uh, the design, the whole design process is uh, one of the funnest parts of what we do. Yeah, Mist was different because right up front from the beginning we had to uh, sit down and spend a good month or over a month, it was about a month, month and a half, um, every day just designing uh, all the worlds, all the, uh, everything involved with it, well, sitting down yeah. and, uh, and going over puzzles and whether or not they'd be too hard or too easy and, uh, and whether or not they fit with the story because there was so much uh, story that was being developed at the same time. Right. It could kind of open up to the side where the... Um, so we'd extend the gameplay by by having just the depth, um, up the depth in the, uh, in the amount of places to explore. I mean, just so vast that, that you just felt like it was going on forever. And so we just go back and forth and back and forth, and you wouldn't believe some of the stupid ideas that we end up, Robin, ends up <laughs> coming up with. Missed Island. Ha ha ha! This is where we film incredible movies. This is our incredible blue screen. Uh, blue screen. This is a blue screen table. A real high quality production. That's a dictionary on the table. I think it was 1995 on sale. Special deal of 1995. Yeah, we really got a good deal on that. It's regular like 99 bucks. Rand and I have always been very much into the detail of things, the richness of things, and so when we did MIST, we wanted it to be a very rich environment and a very detailed environment. And graphically, uh, that meant a lot of work. We are using a computer, in essence, to build sets. Um, the stuff that we're doing for MIST, basically, has to be fully realized in order to move a sort of a virtual camera around this kind of virtual set. You take a camera and you place it in various positions in order to move, say, from one room to another or down a hallway. It's just a sequence of camera shots that are taken in a computer that end up looking photographic and end up helping, um, end up allowing the player to really believe that they're sitting in this world. For example, if we're building a room, we tell the computer, okay, a wall goes in this place and another wall goes here, and the, the floor goes here, and, um, a desk goes over here, and the desk has this wood surface, and it has these little gold handles in the front, and it has a carving in the, the front of the wood, or inlaid wood at this part. We would build an incredible amount of detail into our models. Um, it was a time-consuming process, uh, it meant that we would include everything up to the tiniest little screw or nail. And I started off kind of seeing it from an artist's perspective. I would look for the most interesting scene that I could come up with. But, but the problem I ran into was that every time I made it look interesting, it didn't work for the interface because it was unrealistic. I mean, you don't look at everything as a composition. When you're walking through a room, you're either just walking through a room or you're stopping and staring at everything. And the hardest thing for me was to try to make that transition from trying to make everything look really pretty composed and make it work as far as interface goes. When we first started out, we had really no idea how we were going to be able to create these landscapes, especially how we were going to be able to create terrains uh, where we specified what we wanted the terrain to be shaped like. We came up with a way um, to create a terrain by basically painting the terrain um, in grayscale, a, a large picture of the terrain in grayscale the light areas of that grayscale image would represent the areas of the terrain that would lift up very high. It would be very high, like a mountain or a hill, for example. We would bring that grayscale image then, simply bring it into Stratavision, and uh, extrude it in Stratavision, and um, voila, there we had our incredible terrains.
we needed to put some sort of texture on those to really bring them to life. Uh, all we had to do was just look at our terrain, uh, decide which areas would have grass, which areas would be covered with rock, and paint that. Uh, we'd ended up with a nice little color map that we could then wrap to our terrain. Uh, once we had our terrains done, we uh, could then do things like add trees, add hundreds of trees to a terrain, uh, build, basically build a forest. We knew at that point, yeah, we can do this. We can do the whole thing uh, as a 3D uh, rendered uh, island. Then I was sitting down watching Little Mermaid with my kids, and uh, they had some kind of blowfish or a puffer fish or something in there. And I said, you know, that's kind of interesting shape. And didn't really think much about it, but when I sat down at the computer again, suddenly started modeling and just playing around in macro model, and boom, there it popped. There was a ship. In order to figure out what sound, I'd have to wait until they actually finished the art, put it in context, and then I could say, ah, that's the kind. The chime, the clock tower, uh, I knew we needed a chime, a big chime, that's a big clock. So what I ended up doing is um, just taking my Craftsman 7 8 inch wrench with a lifetime guarantee to, um, I just whapped it and it had such a reverberant sound, of course it was too high. We just dropped, I just dropped the sound lower and lower and lower till he had this big, nice bell sound from a wrench. Ah, the most hateful sound. Had to be the bubbles. What you hear are actually uh, bubbles in a toilet. I tried big, big tubes, little tubes, sticking it way down there, you know, in the part where the trap goes down, and uh, finally got it, but that was the biggest pain. Cirrus, Akinor. <laughs> we didn't want music interfering with the gameplay. And so we weren't going to put any music in. Um, when we finally did do a couple songs, we realized it wasn't an interference. It didn't sound like Super Mario Brothers. Uh, they seemed to really help the mood of certain places that that you were at in the game. Once I sit down on the computer um, with a song in my mind I can I can get it out fairly quickly. So I think the songs went pretty quick. Um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> The biggest problem during the whole development was was the CD-ROM speed. First thing we did was crop the images down to 8-bit using adaptive palettes for each age. And that worked great. We've got images on each age that look like 24-bit images. Um, and then we also used um, QuickTime compression for each of the uh, for each of the images for the stills, not only for the movies, but also for each of the of the still pictures. Not been warned. <laughs> uh, ended up with images that are started out at 500k down to approximately 80k. Which one are you working on? Uh, nothing. Putting it together, um, we used uh, HyperCard um, 
as a shell, basically. And then uh, John Miller from Simplex, um, we worked closely with him on the Color X commands to take out anything that wasn't necessary for getting the color to the screen as fast as possible. Probably one of the most helpful things we did is we went through some focus group testing. That was an incredible um, way to, to get some um, really amazing input. And that's it. That's, and getting to my notes, it's a great idea, a great concept. It's a complete departure from the main line of anything that's out there on the market today. Right there, this is not any game, <laughs> any paradigm, anything yeah. you've ever seen before. You have no preconceived notions because you go into this and you're just, it's something totally new. That this game is so different and the concept of living inside this world is what happens if you get sucked in, if you have time to play it, you just keep going and going and going and going. There's nothing like that at all.